Welcome to our session, 40 Under 40. Um, bold insights from rising stars. Our rising stars are on the stage. I'm a dimming star, that's why I'm not on the stage. And uh, or a failing star, I'm not sure which one that is, but, uh, but my name is Ben Harvey, and uh, from E.L. Harvey and Sons up in Westboro, Massachusetts. And I chair the National Waste and Recycling Association's Board of Trustees. And, for, and I got volunteered to do this, so I'm anxious to, to be here today. I'm happy to be here today to have our rising stars talk about some of the things that they've been very successful at. So before we start, I'm going to read um, everybody's bio. This is an open discussion, panel discussion. I've got some questions, but certainly if any of you have any questions, and I've also asked the panelists if I fail to ask them a question of something important that they would like to discuss, that with, this is just kind of an open, open, like I said, an open discussion today. So I'm going to start with their bios. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, Jesse, Jesse Escobar is a recycling coordinator. As, as recycling coordinator, Jesse manages UCLA's comprehensive recycling programs and is responsible for ensuring that UCLA reaches its goal of 100% diversion from landfills by 2020, which is a, a, an aggressive goal, figuring that this is 18 and we've got two years to do that, so we'll be anxious to see <laughs> where uh, Jesse said, uh, sits on that. Previously, Jesse was safety technician at EH&S. He was in the United States, Air, United States Air Force for six years and served three combat tours in support of Iraqi freedom. Thank you very much for your service. He graduated from Cal State University Northridge and earned a Bachelor of Science in Environmental and Occupational Health. Uh, Anna, Anna is there, okay. Uh, Anna Delage, did I say that correct? Close enough. Is, is, a North, is a North Carolina native who calls Columbia, South Carolina home. I like South Carolina. As a recycling market development manager at the South Carolina Department of Commerce, she provides one-on-one -on -one materials management consulting for new and existing businesses, accelerates program development and implementation for Don't Waste Food, South Carolina, and your bottle means more jobs and is the staff, staff support for the Recycling Market Development Advisory Council. In 2010, she served as the project manager for, Rich, project manager for Richland County's Energy Efficiency and Community Block Grant, overseeing 2.2 million in federal energy and waste reduction grants. In 2012, Anna helped develop Richland County's vision and strategy for sustainability by collaborating to create the Central Midlands Regional Sustainability Plan. Anna served as Richland County's first sustainability manager, during which time she directed sustainability programs, projects, and policies for the county. Her ability to institu institutionalize sustainability, align complex goals across multiple stakeholder groups, leverage resources, and implement successful sustainability programs resulted in the county reducing energy use by almost 10% in five years. Very, very, very good. Next is Nicole. Uh, Nicole Willett it has over 15 years of experience in the waste management industry, both in Canada and the United States. She is currently the Director of Public Sector and Public Affairs for Waste Management Eastern Canada, where she is responsible for all public sector customers and government relations in Ontario. Nicole is a valued member of the multiple industry boards, including Ontario Waste Management Association, and was appointed by Regional Council to the Halton, Ontario Region Waste Advisory Committee. Nicole has a BS in business administration from the University of Arizona. Not sure how you got from Arizona up to Canada. We'll have to talk about that one. And, uh, and an MBA from Arizona State University. Raised in Arizona, she currently resides in Toronto, Canada. That is a big switch. And then Sean on the end. Sean Finn is a second generation environmental services professional with almost a lifetime of experience in and around the hauling industry. From as young as he can remember, he would spend weekends running around hauling yards and transfer stations, asking lots of questions, digging through trash, and climbing over the equipment. Between the ages of 18 and 22, he worked at Chicago's 34th Street Murph between semesters in college. Must have been a fun place to work. <laughs> Currently, Sean is the sustainability gym manager for the Universal Waste Systems, for Universal Waste Systems, Inc., uh, Universal Waste Systems is one of the, the seven Recycle LA service providers for the City of Los Angeles Recycle LA program. 
Based in the northeast section of Los Angeles, Sean is responsible for overseeing the day-to-day -day operations of the Zero Waste team, creating educational materials and outreach, fostering positive customer relations with the key community business leaders and major customers, and heading up the social media U, uh, UWS company. How do you, how do you, say, you know, I'm not a high tech guy, so what, what is that little ad? At, ad at thank UWS you. Company. Thank you. <laughs> I, I don't I don't tweet oh, or no, no, no dot com. No dot com, sorry. <laughs> and to name a few. During the six six months transition into Recycle LA, Sean and the team from uh, United Waste Universal Waste Systems work hard, hand in hand to create a unique waste assessment tool to cater to their region of Los Angeles. They were successfully able to transition over sixty five percent of the customers in their zone with signed agreements administer almost 5,500 waste assessments and delivered over 10,000 new recycling and organics containers. Before Universal Waste Systems, Sean was the community relations manager for public services in Los Angeles. So he does have quite a varied assortment of time in the, in the industry. So we're gonna start by letting, I've, I've read their bios, but now they wanna talk about themselves and what, what got them to be 40 under 40. So the first question is, well, I want you to tell a little bit about yourself and how you got to be a rising star in the industry. Kind of an inter introduction. And I don't, you wanna go first, uh, Jesse? No, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, so, as Ben said, my name is Jesse Escobar. Um, honestly, I was in the Air Force for uh, six years, did three combat tours, got out, and then uh, I didn't have anything to do. <laughs> so I decided to go to school and I really got into environmental health. Once I got into environmental health, um, the, the aspect of my major was really sustainability. That, that's what really, attracted me. Um, so I started looking for jobs in the industry and um, I didn't find any. So I went to uh, environmental health, uh, or environment, the Office of uh, Environmental Health and Safety at UCLA. I got hired there and luckily within six months, the recycling coordinator position opened up at UCLA to help with the zero waste goal. Um, I, I jumped all over it. Um, I was brand new to this industry then. So I, I spent nights just learning everything there is to know about recycling. Um, in the military, one of the things that I did was I, I was a logistics sergeant in the, uh, as a cop. I was a cop, but I would do logistics for our convoys, and I started getting into data and logistics that way. Um, so I took this approach like that. Uh, I started trying to figure out ways to collect the data I needed in order to work more efficiently, more effectively, um, keep our clients happy while trying to reach our goal. There's 1,500 tons of waste generated on UCLA every day. There's 80,000 plus people on any given school day, over 180 buildings, and we're building new ones all the time. I mean, we have a housing area. We have, we're a small city, really. So the only thing that I could do was separate things into uh, groups and streams, really, and mm -hmm. start breaking it down that way. Um, at the time, 2013, 2014, this whole push for software and apps and data and everything wasn't really there. So I started developing my own apps. Uh, I'm tech savvy enough to have a little background in coding. And uh, I, I just, I took what people were using as inventory apps and started taking inventory of my campus bins. I started with litter bins on campus. There's over 600 litter bins on campus and only three guys to service them all. So I wanted to know where high points are, where low points are, when during the year I can cut that down to two people so I can reallocate that resource to use somewhere else. And, um, figure out whatever else is happening in these areas. Uh, what I did is I put the app on, I, I put a barcode on these bins and every time they went by, they simply had to scan into it, automatically populating a spreadsheet that give, gave me the information of how full it was, uh, how many times, so I could see how, how many times are going a day, um, a week, and start cutting down. Over the time, I was able to cut one person that next summer and I started uh, really making a push for our e-waste. Uh, our e-waste program. So slowly stuff has evolved from that. I've built more apps for that, for our program that way. And now, yeah, that's what got me into this whole 40 under 40 thing. Cool. That's awesome. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Jesse. Nicole? Well, I don't, I mean, thanks for your service. There's nothing I can say that I did that, that competes with like a military tour in Iraq. So Appreciate congratulations it. for that. Um, my experience is a little bit different. I started in, in the States, as, as Ben said in the introduction, and came to Canada. But I think really that the thing that has sort of 
kind of guided my career a little bit are two things that are a little bit different. And one is I'm a mom. I have two boys. One's nine and seven. And I look at sort of the waste industry. And what happens is, is that I know everybody that's at this conference is responsible for the planet that my kids are going to live on. And I hope I get, have to get grandkids and those kids. So that's what kind of motivates me as I sort of navigate the day, whether it's even just, okay, I'm going to show them what, you know, a hard day's work looks like, or I'm going to show them what it takes, you know, to kind of manage a career and be a mom or um, why the environment's important. So my six-year-old's in kindergarten and they do, um, I talk to municipalities people a lot about, you know, landfills and the benefits to landfills, landfill gas to energy, what, you know, it's not always the bad thing and how, you know, we can be a good community partner. So sixth grade, they're talking about things in their community. And my, you know, most six-year-olds talk about the police officers in our community and the mailmen in our community. And my son, she sent me the picture of the whiteboard and it was landfill gas to energy, how we're community partners, the kid like absorbed it. So I was like, this is great. So that's one thing that really has kind of motivated me along the way was to make sure that we leave this environment in a better place. And then secondly, I've been really fortunate because along the way in my career, I've had people that have made extra time for me. And I've been able to kind of take that extra time and see, um, use those opportunities. So I think it was those people along the way that took two extra minutes to kind of explain to me you know, how do I price a bid? Or, you know, Nicole, that's not a side load truck, that's a front load truck, you know, some of the basics. And it, it was really important. And it might have been my customers that have taught me things. I mean, I've learned more from my customers than I have sometimes, you know, from reading a book um, or just mentees. I, I was lucky enough with waste management, they assigned me a mentor. So I had a mentor throughout um, my, my career to kind of help me grow a little bit. So I think those are the two things that made me successful. Great, thank you very much. Anna? And Nicole, that, that's amazing to hear that work-life work balance. I feel like that's the next stage of my life. So, um, I'm going to be calling on you for some tips. I have um, a good boss. He's in the room. <laughs> uh, well, uh, so I'm Anna Delage, and, you know, so I'm, I was trying to kind of pinpoint, you know, what was that moment where I decided to kind of step into this industry or what kind of was, what was the gateway um, and, you know, I, I can think back to being at the university, you know, beautiful spring day outside on the quad and, you know, I come up to the quad and there's this big tarp out and people are going through other people's garbage on campus and that, so they're essentially doing a waste sort on campus and I just thought, I was totally turned off by it, but really curious at the same time and I ended up just digging in, you know, getting elbows deep in, in other people's trash. I and mean, I mean, is that common? How, how many of you guys have done a waste sort or gone, did, dug into the garbage? I feel like it's, it's like, it's something that we, we all share. <laughs> uh, but uh, I mean, that really sparked my interest. I mean, just to, just my curiosity of seeing, wow, I mean, we're, all of this is being thrown in the trash. I mean, half of the materials were recyclable. So, so much material was organics. And then a lot of perfect, perfectly good textiles and shoes. And I just thought, wow, what are we doing? And like, who's thinking about trash? You know, we need really smart people thinking about trash. And, and uh, yeah, at the time I, um, you know, I was going to school for pre-med, but um, I, uh, this was part of, uh, this event was part of a week-long event that they had on campus where they had, you know, tree plantings and organic gardening and uh, speaking, speaking mm -hmm. events with, you know, faculty and staff, you know, to connect with what's happening with sustainability, week-long <coughs> activities, and I ended up running that uh, four semesters in a row afterwards, uh, realizing that you know, this is, this is where I want to be, change my major to environmental policy and management and economics and, um, and then worked in nonprofits, uh, doing nonprofit uh, organizing for a year, but really decided that I wanted to go home to the Southeast. So had a great opportunity come up for Richland County to start their office uh, of sustainability and, um, you know, worked worked there for six years and had the opportunity to come uh, work at the South Carolina Department of Commerce. And so I feel really excited uh, to be connecting with people on what's happening with within this industry, you know, specifically, you know, we track the economic impact of what's happening with recycling. And so that, you know, being good for the economy is, is a huge part of what we talk about all across the state. And we're, we've been really lucky in South Carolina because we've had someone 
you know, at the Department of Commerce since 1991, looking at recycling market development. And we've done a great job of you know, bringing a lot of those industry partners uh, to the table. And so um, we do a lot of work with your bottle means jobs. And so that's just making the connection of what happens when you recycle that bottle and how it gets turned into all these really cool products. And, you know, you, you can just see like the light bulbs go off when people say, wow, my bottle can be made into a t-shirt or, uh, you know, uh, you know, men's, men's slacks. I mean, I mean, it's just amazing automotive uh, opportunities. And so, you know, being able to share that story and see those light bulbs go off and other people um, like they did when some of my early discovery is just really exciting to see and, you know, to be a part of that, that energy. And um, I'm what I'm really excited to be working on food waste recovery, because I feel like that's, you see that full circle of waste equals food all the way along the supply chain. And, you know, that I feel like that that pathway to sustainability is going to be critical, you know, as, as we start to move forward. And it's exciting, exciting to be with you guys to be a part of that discussion. <clears throat> so thanks. Thank you very much, Anna. Sean, you want to go ahead? Doesn't seem like you needed to make a decision on a career path. This is, yeah, <laughs> it's uh, predestined, I guess you could say. Um, <clears throat> so as uh, we already kind of heard a little bit, I was basically born into this industry. My father, uh, who's actually here right now, made it. Um, <laughs> is he here in the room yeah. right now? We'll push you right there. <laughs> He's the one who put me uh, to work at the sorting center at the Murph when I was 18. We were just talking about this last night. I came home that first day and said, what did I do to you? You know, what, why would you, why would you do this to me? Um, I'm sorry. You know, he says, don't worry, your brother's going to do it too when he's 18. Um, but that was kind of, uh, the first professional uh, aspect of it. Like, like you heard, uh, I grew up running around the transfer station sorts sorting centers basically every Saturday and Sunday I'd go with my dad when he had extra work that he had to do or you know basically tag along with the old man it was uh, really fun so uh, when I graduated from university I decided I didn't want to deal with any sort of weather uh, that Chicago has to offer so I basically walked across the stage and got in a car and moved to Los Angeles where I first started working uh, as a community relations manager for Republic Services. Specifically, I worked with uh, LA Unified School District uh, in helping them to increase their recycling program uh, when Republic won the bid. Uh, they had about a thousand schools that was geographically the size of Rhode Island. Uh, so we had to go through and do a waste assessment for each school, really help identify you know, what materials were being disposed of and start having that conversation of, of changing the culture of disposal, uh, not only in LAUSD, but I say it all the time now, in the city of Los Angeles. And that's kind of what I hang my hat on when I do these presentations and I speak to people. It's like we really need to focus on changing the culture of disposal in the country, I guess the world. So um, when the opportunity arose for the city of LA waste franchise, uh, Universal Waste had a position that I was uniquely qualified for. And the rest is kind of history. The transition is kind of done for the most part now for Universal Waste at least. I can't really speak on any of the other haulers uh, growing pains, but there were some growing pains. I'm not gonna sit here and say there weren't, uh, but I think that my ability to go deal with major customers as well as small mom and pop shops have really helped round me out and given me, you know, the consideration for the award. So when I was selected for this award, it, you know, was very humbling and very exciting. And it really puts, uh, you know, some of those 3.30 safety meetings and, you know, <laughs> six o'clock conference meetings and Saturday events and Earth Day events and things of that nature, you know, it really makes it all worthwhile. Great. Thank you very much, um, all of you. Um, Nicole, how do you see our industry, the waste, the recycling, organics collection industry changing over the next five years? What, what, I, I can see five years. I'm going to ask you about 20 years too, but go for it. <laughs> we're going to do it five years first and see what you, what you, what you, where you think this industry is going to be or what's going to change. So by show of hands in the room, how many of you have ordered something from Amazon in the last six months? How many of you had to call Amazon to make that transaction happen? If you can keep your hands up, that'd be great. So one. 
So what we saw happen in sort of e-commerce with technology changing the way that purchasing of goods happens, I think is going to happen in the, in the waste industry. And I don't know, you know, we've all talked about, is there going to be uber trash or, you know, what what is going to be? But I really think technology is is changing. And I think we've already seen some of those changes, whether it's customers' expectations now and what they want in terms of being able to order a bin or be serviced or be notified if something happened. I think that's one big component that's happening. I think the second is food waste. I think we're seeing, you know, there's a lot of cities that are going to food waste bans. There's a lot of organic bans. I know, you know, I'm in Eastern Canada. We have a mandatory food waste ban out of landfill by 2022. And the interesting part is, is legislation's ready for it, but I don't know if technically, you know, operationally we're ready for it. I mean, we don't have transfer stations that are permitted to take organics, and it's not just waste management, it's anybody. Um, to accommodate some of the legislative changes. So I think, you know, you've got technology, which is really going to change the future. You've got food waste, which is really going to change the future. And I think my hope is that we find a way to collect safer. So, you know, SWANA released data. You know, we had 18% increase of fatalities in our industry, you know, year over year. And I think, you know, the people that are, you know, 40 under 40, 50 under 50, 70 under 78, like we are all responsible for making that better. And whether that's, you know, you know, self-driving trucks or, you know, collision technology or even just a better way to collect, I think that's what needs to change. And I think that needs to change even before you know, our customers can order a bin online. I think all of us going home at the end of the night is far more important. So those are my three. I, I agree. Safety is so huge right now in our industry. And, and I know that our trade association, you mentioned SWANA, but I know that the NWRA is also looking at, at really boosting up our safety. Uh, Anna, do you have any different things that you see happening in, over the next five years? Yeah. Well, or do you want to take I, it out further? I would definitely <laughs> agree. And, you know, especially... You know, it's interesting, like if we, we look at our investment and we track our investment, you know, in the recycling industry as well as our, our job growth. And so our job growth in the recycling industry uh, for new businesses or expansions coming in has actually, you know, decreased in the last five years. And obviously that's because of technology, uh, robotics coming online. And, and But the interesting thing is we're seeing the opposite thing for the composting industry. So that infrastructure, not only is that infrastructure developing, but we're also seeing that job growth. And I think that this is just really kind of an exciting time. I mean, you know, to look at South Carolina four years ago, we had one commercial scale composting facility that could take food waste. Now we have 18 counties that can serve uh, for commercial food waste collection. And I mean, that is, I mean, that's just four years, you know, I mean, and so it just, it shows that there's so much growth happening in this industry and so much opportunity. But, you know, like Nicole said, you know, we hear from our large clients, our commercial clients that as they're, you know, if they're hauling for, you know, if they're contracting for a hauler, their, you know, grocery store, for example, they want to contract with one hauler all up and down the East Coast if they can. And, um, you know, right now it's so, composting is such a localized solution, you know, 75 mile radius, you know, they say, uh, you know, for, for making it cost effective. And so you have a lot of these small operations in place. And so how do you kind of connect that web, connect that infrastructure web in a way that supports everybody and supports the entire industry. And so I think that we're going to see a lot of growth in this area, and it's, it's pretty exciting. Great. Thank you. Sean, anything that you see out there different than what the, the two ladies on the... No, I think that they are right. Uh, you know, Nicole brought up a good point about infrastructure. The legislation is still pretty far ahead uh, as far as the infrastructure goes. Um, but I would really like to see a more focus on education. I mean, everybody in this room knows the low-hanging fruits of plastic, paper, cardboard, uh, aluminum, tin, things of that nature. Um, but people really need to understand that those are the materials that can go. In L.A., I just see a lot of aluminum cans and plastic bottles, and those are scavenged almost as quickly as they hit the container. Uh, the other thing that I like uh, under this Recycla program, the L.A. franchise, is they are allowing the haulers to issue contamination fines. And that's really the only way we're going to be getting clean commodities. And we all know what's going on in China right now. They're really rejecting a lot of our recyclable materials because it's contaminated. So it's the education and it's the ability to issue fines 
um, to the customers for not disposing everything properly. Now, when I say fines, I just want everybody to know we have the ability to issue them. So when we come across contaminated containers in LA, we send our zero waste team out and say, hey, you know, Sean's chop, uh, you know, pork chop store, your recycling is contaminated. Why is it? Let's take a look in your container and see exactly what's going on. And like I said, we try and adjust that culture of disposal so they're not running into this contamination. And we all know like a restaurant, if they are disposing of their food waste in a recycling, traditional recycling, not an organics container, it could contaminate an entire truckload. So it's really that initial conversation, changing everything, and if we have to issue fines, then that some, unfortunately sometimes the only, people, the only way people change their behavior is if it hits them in the pocketbook. And that, I think, is, is going to be one of the things moving forward that will really help clean our recycling stream and get the disposal to where it needs to be. Uh, thank you, Sean. Uh, Jesse, you've got a very aggressive goal of 100% diversion in, by 2020, so you must have a five-year plan out there somewhere to, to, to achieve that. Yeah, there is. I think uh, my situation is a little bit unique because I'm... I'm actually right before the material gets to you. I'm the guy that's supposed to prepare that material for all the waste haulers. That's why I thought it was important for me to kind of come. Um, Sean's right. Uh, some of these fines are great things, but we also have to be able to educate the client before we can start finding them. We have to let them know what they can put into or what they can't put in to reduce that contamination. And in a place like UCLA, uh, you can't reach anyone. When you ask like things that are going to change in five years, the culture, that's the biggest thing to me. It's already changed in the last five years. And I can't imagine how much more it'll change in the next five years, more so in the next 20 years. I mean, compostables and our food waste is a huge thing right now, but then we're also going to touch on reusables. All right, there's a lot of stuff that we could be reusing to reduce that waste on the back end purchasing. There's a lot of stuff we could be minimizing on our end that could reduce that waste and eliminate contamination on the back end. So getting that information out to, uh, to more people is really one of the biggest things that I'm working on at UCLA. Um, because of the contamination stuff and all this, uh, trying, to mini trying to minimize all that, what we're really working on, one of the things we're looking at is sorting our own material before it goes to a waste hauler. Not only will that cut the cost down of picking up at each bin or each building on campus, because they'll pick up from one central location, you know, we'll pick it up from the buildings, take it to this one area, develop a small little sort machine. I'm calling it sorting out, sorting out resources together. So it's a sort program, right? And what we're gonna, what we're planning to do is, I mean, if some of this stuff goes through, it, have one of these big companies, BHS, uh, Vecoplan, um, develop a, a simple screen. I mean, there's a lot of studies that have been done on sizing waste. So let's use that. Let's use that to our advantage. We don't necessarily need to break it down to, you know, the PTs and all these other plastics. All I need to do is separate it into wet, dry, and none of those. Do you know what I mean? Give you guys the materials so you guys so the waste haulers can sort it even further. I think that's one of the biggest things that's going to happen is is having little satellite sites like this, um, especially in L.A., where it's hard to get any land whatsoever. You know, uh, it's going to be something that not only will the benefit will the waste hauler benefit, but the actual client can benefit from working their own waste. You've all mentioned education, uh, cleaning up contamination, and. I think we all in the industry struggle with that all the time and, and making sure that we're providing a clean product. But I'm, this is the tricky question. How do we go about doing this and getting that message out to the millions of people that are doing this? How do we change their habits? We've got, we've got people now today got, got accustomed to single stream, but they think single stream is everything in their, in their house. How do we go about educating them? You know, Sean, you mentioned, you know, minimizing maybe that, that list of acceptable materials. What, what's, what's the challenge out there to educate them? And Anna, I'll, I'll start with you this time, if you don't mind. So I'm a big fan of consistent messaging. You know, I mean, that's something that we are really working with, with the Department of Health and Environmental Control. So because we have all of our local governments have different messaging and it's very confusing. And so, you know, what might work right down the road, you, you get a totally different marketing approach. You, I mean, you get a totally different vision, you know, from, to, from a no local government that's, you know, you know, 10 minutes down the road. And so I think we really need to capitalize on getting some consistent messaging. I know there's a few national programs that have done a really great job of building in some of that infrastructure, but I think it's really pu pushing that information out to local governments in a way that really makes sense. 
you know, one of the things that we are seeing too with a lot of our material recovery facilities is that, you know, they're restructuring their new contracts to share the risk and the reward. So in good times, good economic times, local governments are going to see that benefit and in bad economic times, they're going to share in the cost. And so, I mean, you have a direct link to the success of your program and it does put a little bit more pressure on on local governments to say, you know, we really need to think really critically about effective programming and effective uh, marketing solutions and, you know, getting that education right. So it's it's really kind of a, a, a it's a shared risk and shared reward. Sean, you brought this up. You got any any good ways of getting that message out there? I, I agree. We got to get it out there. And and you know, Anna just mentioned um, you know audits and stuff like that. Is is are we going to get to the point in in the industry where each municipality might be audited for the contamination level that's in there? And then you, you mentioned the fines or a charge, an extra charge to do that. Do you, do you see that coming, Sean? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but. It's just the conversation. I think that's something that you know, Universal Waste is, is really ahead of as far as being uh, a recycled service provider. We don't want to issue fines. If anybody has read anything, not recently, about the trash franchise in Los Angeles because we're pretty much starting to flatten out all those kinks. But you know, when we first started, the, the cost was associated with a big issue with a lot of people. And you know, we, that concern hasn't fallen on deaf ears, hence the reason why we don't want to issue those contamination fees right away. It's just is, it's not a cool thing for us to do. So when we come across contamination, we send our zero waste team out and it's that conversation that say, hey, you know, you guys, you know, Cheryl in accounting, she loves her Snapple bottles. That's what I'm seeing in your trash. This could, it's lost diversion. You guys could be helping the city reach the environmental goals, the state environmental goals. Like, and it's just taking your recyclable material and making sure it's clean, dry, and empty and putting it in the blue bin versus the black bin. And it's so simple as that. It's just kind of silly that we have to keep coming out here and having these conversations. But at the same time, we'll come out and have these same conversations because we're all dedicated to it. So, you know, I'd say newsletters are a good thing, but everybody who's worked for a hauler and had to do a newsletter, you know, how many people actually read them? Very, very little. There are some uh, advertisements on TV. I saw one the other day that, you know, really kind of talk about how you can reuse plastic bottles and how a lot of those things are repurposed, which I think are fantastic. Uh, for me, I focus on the low hanging fruit. You know, I, I said it already, I'll keep saying it paper, plastic, aluminum cans, tins. Just let's get that culture where everybody is putting those containers or those materials in the proper container. And then I can focus on some other more sp specific to your location's uh, disposal issues. So it's, it's, it's going to be a long way. Um, it's going to take some time for us to do it, but it's good that we're having these conversations now. Uh, I spent the week this past weekend at Coachella. Uh, and I was able to watch everybody. Yeah, it's been a great Don't. last couple of days for us. Um, Coachella to Vegas. Yeah, yeah, it's been fun. Um, but I watched uh, people, you know, Coachella is a very young dynamic that they have there. And I watched as I was waiting for Beyonce to play it, the people disposing of their materials. And on day one, everything was kind of contaminated. You know, they had a compost bin, they had recycling and they had plastic, uh, recycling and trash. And as the festival went on and I was peeking in and doing my own little waste assessments, I could see that they had right corrected their disposal issues. So the people who were attending the festivals, whether they were of right mind or not, knew to put the plastics in this container, to put their food waste in this container with limited signage. So that gives me hope for the future that you know the future generations have been educated enough on their disposal techniques to you know really help correct this ship. Yeah, I, I, I've uh, I've talked to a lot of people that say they're pressured into doing this by their kids. And yep. Nicole, you mentioned it earlier with with, with your kids. Um, Jesse, you've got a kind of a, a unique unique situation where you've got a clientele that changes every four years. And uh, how do you how do you go about making that happen to to reach your goal of 100 percent diversion? Uh, well, for one thing, if you make a mistake one year, you're good. Three years later, you should be all right. You, know what I'm saying? you can fix that, and nobody remembers it. Um, well, we you know. With with the culture changing as fast as it is, you, you you do see a lot of these younger kids coming in and, and really understanding how and what to do without necessarily have to push it as much. But I think that uh, pushing out you know uh, information as much as you can and testing whatever you know it is you can test 
is really the way that we, we go, we're, we're going to get them go about it. Um, one of the things we started doing is uh, was during their u- uh, usual like orientation in the beginning of the school year, like say September time, right before they start the classes, we started uh, doing little, you know, PSAs for uh, sustainability and our goals and our zero waste goals and the bins on campus. On campus, everything's color coded uh, because of the language barriers we have. We try to focus around the, the people there and ge- instead of generalizing everything, we try to make things specific to certain part of campuses in a general way. And what I mean by that is there's certain, I mean, our campus is diverse as our students. There's areas that are, uh, you know, engineering areas that generate a lot of legacy metal waste. And then you have lab spaces, you have areas that have stage waste from um, a lot of the arts uh, locations. So you try to find these and make it simple enough for them to dispose of their waste, but also specific enough so they understand what they're doing. Um, does that make sense? <laughs> it's one of those things that we try to reach everyone on each part of campus as much as possible. We got a great sustainability team and we go out and we do waste audits uh, all the time. I mean, we have classes, we have professors that uh, we, we team up with and one of the la- like some of their labs what we do is like for one lab what we do is every October um, like no, October November we set up you know huge waste audit for different parts of their area on campus and that way they can see this is what they're generating this is a trust that you have and this is the impact that you're making by just disposing of it uh, th- there hasn't been a time after one of these waste audits where these students haven't really become aware of what they're doing. They become so aware that a lot of them even switch into, you know, um, environmental programs on campus. And, and that's, that's one of the best parts of my, my job is, is working with them, you know, working with the students, the younger population and everything will change in time. You know? we're, we're just in, you know, we're on the forefront of this. Give us 20 years and, you know, people that, I mean, everybody who's set this path for us did an amazing job. And now it's our time to kind of, you know, pick up that torch and run with it. Well, that's good, because I might not be here in 20 years. So somebody's <laughs> got to carry that along. Nicole, do you have any uh, insight into education and, and getting the message out that we need to get out? Hey, I think I think this crew has covered it. There's nothing I can add. I think I think the only kind of interesting is, is I think we just have to provide clarity. And in the education, I mean, I can tell you that sometimes I really like to think about what I can recycle at home, I can't recycle in the office. And I think sometimes people get a little bit confused. So whether it's just even, I know we put signs up and whatever, but sometimes, you know, you sit there with your coffee cup and it's like, okay, black plastic, is this recyclable or is this not recyclable? Okay, wait, I don't know. And if I don't know, I can guarantee you, and if you guys don't know, I mean, we're all in trouble. I'm teasing. But, um, and I know you guys know where it goes. But anyway, yeah. um, <laughs> I don't. I mean, that would be my only thing. It's just a little bit more clarity. Do you, do you think there's there's a mixed message out there between the commercial mm-hmm. um, education that we're doing at the commercial level and the municipal at the household level? Is is there? I I, I know there isn't mine. I guess so. I'm asking. Do you see that? For sure. And I think the other thing that's really going to start changing it even more and will be even uh, even a little bit more difficult is we know China's changing right now what they're going to buy. And, you know, mixed waste paper right now is something that, you know, we don't know if we're going to be able to actually find a recycler for it. So does that mean that in in two years, if there's another big change with mixed waste paper, that we're going to have to change our education again to say, actually, your newspaper can't go in. Your, your news, we no longer have an end market for your newspaper, so no, it's no longer recyclable. Because, you know, I think we have to sometimes remember, remind people, it's not about what we can put in the bin, it's what we can reuse on the, on the back end, right? That's what recycling is. It's, you know, reducing our need for resources. So... There is a difference, though, between what we can recycle commercially and residentially. So um, I want to follow that stream along a little bit. I'm kind of off my script. I left it over there. Um, <laughs> you, you mentioned we, we all I think I think the world knows what's happening in China. And if you don't, uh, you just pick up a paper and you can read about it. And, and Nicole just mentioned it um, as, as it, and we, we always talk about the the changing recycle stream, the, the you know, the light weighting and all of this other stuff. And, you know, a lot of a lot of municipalities, a lot of states have bans. You talked about the organics ban. I'm from Massachusetts. We got a ban on on everything in the world um, that, that <laughs> needs to be recycled. But at the same time, if we can't market that material, mm-hmm. what, what do we do? So um, I, I'm not sure what the question is here, but um, as as we move forward, as 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 new technologies come about, mm-hmm. 
how are we going to deal with this changing? I guess now we'll, let's talk about technology. How are we going to deal with this changing stream of material that's coming into our facilities or that you're collecting? And Sean, I want to start with you this time, if you don't mind. I do mind. Um, <laughs> well, it's too bad. Uh, conversations, uh, simple conversations, really understanding what is coming into our recycling centers, um, what's ultimately ending up at the landfill, and really trying to find a, a final place for these things. It's, I think Jesse kind of touched on it, and um, Nicole as well. It's just how do we reuse these things? Let's stop putting some of these materials in the waste stream to begin with. Whether that's you know buying metal straws and not using plastic straws anymore, uh, reusable bags is another thing that you know we in California at least is is a big ban, um, and just really trying to create a more sustainable culture. So I, as you guys know, I've had quite a long uh, the last couple of days, and I left my reusable water bottle at Coachella, unfortunately. So it kind of pains me a little bit to be participating in this panel, and you guys all see a plastic bottle in my hand. You can recycle it. You're absolutely right, you can. <laughs> but at the same time, I shouldn't have put myself in a situation where this container is here in front of me. So uh, it's just kind of getting everybody to shift from the disposable culture to a reusable culture. That would kind of be my thought. Um, Jesse, I'm going to ask you, that, do, you does it, do you change your purchasing habits at UCLA based on what you see when you do your, your waste audits so that if you don't have a reusable, that you're at least purchasing something that can be recycled underneath the current guidelines? Uh, yeah, so uh, everything, uh, our sustainability policy was actually amended, I think, 2013, 2014 to include purchasing. And um, unfortunately, I, I don't know how really how that's really being applied. Um, what I do see is that there's a huge, I mean, it's going to take time. There's from the time we do a waste audit to actually changing everything, there's so many things that have to change in between. Like, it's not only purchasing, there's also changing policy to do certain things. One of the waste audits I did for our custodial unit, um, uh, we, were, we were actually, it started with just doing a regular building waste audit, and what we found was that uh, there was rolls of toilet tissue just being disposed of, and it turns out that the policy for our custodial unit is that for every bathroom that gets cleaned, everything gets restocked. Whether or not that roll has been used or anything else in there has been used. So we're literally throwing money down the trash. We're buying new material and just letting it go. So one of the things that we worked on was changing that policy. Now that policy is, uh, it has changed in certain areas and is rolling through the university. Now I think they can eventually stop buying the rolls or the material that they were doing, you know, so that way it all kind of ties into each other. Um, I wish this moved a lot faster, but especially in public uh, <laughs> side of things. I don't know if the private is as much, but uh, on our end, uh, it, it takes, you know, a couple of years just to get something like this to go through. And our goal, uh, zero waste by 2020, is a bit ambitious. And I mean, we're working as hard as we can to kind of get there. Nicole, in your opening, you mentioned about the um, organics ban and the lack of an infrastructure as you're moving into that. How do you anticipate dealing with that as you as you collect the organics with no outlet for it? It's no different than what we talked about the Chinese situation right now with the market in China. We're collecting material that doesn't have a place to go. How how do you feel that you're going to deal with that as in the next couple of years? Well, there's, there's two ways. I mean, there's anaerobic digesters that we would direct haul to. It just doesn't make it very efficient. So, you know, you're trying to be more environmentally friendly, but you're, you know, increasing your greenhouse gas emissions because you have more trucks going to direct haul. So that's kind of one part of, you know, the organics. But really it's working with legislation and municipalities. And, you know, it's helping our, our government and our policy writers and, and what we have, the Ministry of Environment, understand, you know, we want to get here too with you. We want to be your partner. And if we can sit down and work together, and I can tell you, you know, if we can create this organics into a slurry, what I can do with it, versus if we create into a cake, what I can do with it, and how that will impact the end market, then it it's a, a lot better. So, you know, one thing that we've been able to do is really start to have conversations with municipalities and conversations with <laughs> government to really say to them, Let's, let's work together on the pre-planning side versus when the 
ball drops, and then we're all scrambling to try and make, you know, this, you know, the proverbial, you know, square circle thing, the square, whatever the saying is. <laughs> but, um, but I think that's really the the key is if we all sit down and work together, it's better. I think the other component is as we look at our long term municipal contracts, whether it's recycling or organics process processing. Um, and what you find is they're 10 to 15 year contracts. So, you know, you sign them in 2000 and they don't expire till 2020. And there's a lot of things that we all know happened between 2000 and 2020, but you go back to the municipalities and if you have a great relationship, you're able to work through that and discuss it. But if it's one of those relationships that sometimes just come down to, well, the contract says, and we agreed to, you know, that we're going to recycle styrofoam or whatever it might be, it's really comes down to then working together and whether that's with municipal partners or working together with legislation or working together with even building plans to, you know, put a shoot for organics so that people will actually recycle. Um, Annie, you, you do, did a lot with um, marketing and, and developing markets in, in South Carolina or trying to develop markets in South Carolina. And I think that that's something that a lot of us and that a lot of our states or a lot of our, our legislators have looked at and, and bringing, bringing industry in that can use these materials. And certainly a lot of it is local. I'm certainly organics is a local thing. You're not going to truck that to, from Massachusetts to South Carolina uh, like other commodities. How successful have you been on bringing industry in or bringing these market uh, developments in? So we try to be the best that we can. <laughs> Um, but we, I, really, when we started in the early 90s, I, I would say I feel very lucky to be where I am you know, at the South Carolina Department of Commerce because they have such a strong, they have such a strong, strong reputation in our state. And so we were, we were specifically housed, we have two people that just look at recycling market development at Commerce, and that, I think it's really unique for a lot of states. Um, so I think early in the 90s when they were collecting material, they didn't necessarily have outlets for that material. And so that market development really started um, from, from some of the early folks that are actually still on our team and still, you know, work with our, us uh, on the global development side, particularly like we just had uh, Eco Melita landed in South Carolina in Orangeburg County um, just a month ago, and so they're going to be, they're interested in uh, carpet, or I'm sorry, carton recycling, uh, so they're taking the full carton, and they'll be able to recycle the, the entire container, and then utilize that for tissue markets, um, and then sell the plastics, and so, and the aluminum, and so, you know, I, I think we try to do the best that we can, we try to get the information out there, we have over 500 uh, recyclers in the state of South Carolina and the fact that we, you know, really focus on tracking that economic impact, you know, we're a $13 billion industry. And so when our global market development team is out, just talking about South Carolina in general, they're talking about recycling. And I don't know if a lot of states are taking that same kind of proactive approach from the business side to make that connection that, you know, recycling is big business in our state and, um, yeah, I think that we're kind of uniquely placed, uh, you know, where we are to really make an impact. <clears throat> okay, I'm just going to throw these questions up there now, and you can, I'm not going to assign them to anybody like Actually, I've been doing. I have one I'd like oh, to tack on just a little bit. Go right ahead. Go right. Yes, go right ahead. Um, so one thing that I did at LAUSD, uh, we all know kids, uh, well, you probably know a little more, but <laughs> some days they'll eat pizza and they'll love it and some days they won't. So we established a pilot program for organics at LA Unified School District uh, for two months or something. And what, what my goal is, is, you know, this is perfectly edible food. What can we do to keep that out of the stream? How can we donate it? You know, in Los Angeles, there's a lot of you know, needy people. There's a lot of hungry kids, you know. So the state feeds, I think, a majority of the students breakfast, lunch, and a snack as well. So what, uh, what I tried to do is really work with the principal and the custodian and local nonprofits, churches, retirement homes, uh, and things of that nature to kind of repurpose that food. Milk is always a little bit difficult to repurpose, but things like apples and bananas and packaged little snacks, uh, granola bars, things of that nature, there are places that will take it. 
So watching food just get thrown away and thrown away over you know, dozens and dozens of elementary schools, I was like pulling it out of the trash, <laughs> putting it in my bag and just giving it to homeless people on the side of the road. Like, hey, I, you look hungry, even if you're not, you know, save it for later. Uh, so the big thing is repurposing. And there's a lot of companies now that'll take like ugly vegetables. Um, we're working with uh, one of the big baseball teams in Los Angeles right now to kind of repurpose their hot dogs at the end of you know their games. Maybe we can give it to a homeless shelter. St. Vincent de Paul is one of Universal's um, companies. So there's edible food out there, and we all know there's hungry people everywhere. So it's really trying to establish partnerships throughout uh, our hauling territory and really making sure that that food isn't going into the waste stream at all. If we can repurpose it, that's the best. And I think we can all agree that that's probably the best play for uneaten and organic foods. Yeah, I would, I would agree that there's a, the hierarchy of reuse before it's, it goes into compost or even to, into anaerobic digestion exactly. and, and then disposal, I think, is that one. What do you see as the biggest opportunities for our industry in, in, the, in the next five to ten years? What, what, what opportunities are there out there to the, to the people in the crowd that might be just getting into the business or want to know? But what, where do you see the opportunities today? And it's up for anybody. Who wants to go? I'll go. All right, nobody wants to go. All right. <laughs> I'll go. Uh, again, from, coming, coming from my uh, point of view, I think there's a huge opportunity for the waste haulers to come in and actually give that education to their clients so they can do the right thing. Reusable is definitely something that it, it's going to be huge, but it's just like composting and food waste. There's no infrastructure separate at all. What do you do? Um, really connecting people, like Sean just said, how, you know, with not only food, but material altogether. I mean, we get everything from desks, filing cabinets, I mean, office supplies. To, to give you an example, at UCLA, there's a, so if you come in, you're a new employee, you get an ergo eval and ergonomic evaluation, make sure that you get all the stuff you need as a safety way, right? Well, if you're there for six, seven months and you leave, then the department just bought a bunch of stuff that they're gonna have to store once a new employee comes in because that new employee is also gonna need their own ergonomic evaluation. And these are you know $700,000 chairs that we're talking about, desks that are expensive that we could, uh, I mean, be doing more with rather than, I mean, we've partnered with people like LA Shares to kind of help uh, you know some of the schools, charter schools, not so much LAUSD, but these <clears> other <throat> schools get supplies they need. But I think that's gonna be pushed even more. Electronics, e-waste is regulated so much that at a certain point, it, it, it's not even worth trying to donate some of this material, especially some of the older stuff that, you know, it could be potentially dangerous, anything with CRTs or, you know, it, but really, there's students out there that don't have computers to learn. And I think the biggest opportunity we have is being able to help them. I know it's a money thing, and now at the end of the day, everybody needs to make their money, but we can we can do this and help each other the same way, which really encompasses the whole concept of sustainability. You know, it's that whole that whole uh, concept of just being able to, to sustain ourselves. I think we can get to a point where we don't even need China. You know, we don't need, even need all their regulations, all this mixed waste stuff we we're talking about. Technology is there, we can go electronic on so many things and eliminate a lot of that problem. You know, some of these people that are a little more obdurate or archaic in their programs can learn how to move forward and move on. And that's just the truth of it. That's where we're heading. The culture is gonna change, but I think we have a unique opportunity here to work together and make this uh, something that we can all use and we can all work well in and make money, really. It's interesting you say that, Jesse. At um, one of our customers, one of our higher education customers, when they have move in and move out, they actually have a tent that's set up, mm -hmm. and anything that can be reused goes to the tent. And then other c students are, can come and yeah. kind of shop in the tent. It's free, obviously, mm -hmm. and it's it's kind of fun to watch it during the day because you have students that will sit there all day and look to see if somebody donates something that they need in their dorm room. Because I mean, I don't know when I was in university, I had no money, so like being able to, it's awesome. it's, yeah. it, and they love it, and they you know kind of are all kind of trying to figure out, but it's the best reuse because it's reusing to their own student population. And it's very similar to what you're talking about with, you know, your faculty, but with the students too, is we saw a case study where it was just remarkable. Uh, job stability, uh, you know, Waste Expo has been around for 50 years. The hauling industry has been around forever. It's not going anywhere. You know, we all go through our ebb and flow um, as far as, you know, the amount of materials that are generated from anybody. But one of the big things I would say is, you know, job stability. This uh, 
trash never stops. Recycling, you know, is going to be another thing. So with the addition of recycling and organics, that's another truck. That's another operator. That's another facility we have to take it. So it's generating a lot of more positions within the industry. Mm -hmm. Anna, do you have any? Well, I would also add, I think an opportunity that we really need to tap into is getting, getting buy-in from our brand owners with all this flexible packaging that's coming online. You know, our material recovery facilities have invested millions of dollars in their equipment, and now they're getting material, you know, with the evolving ton, as they say, you know, so much more material that they can't process, and they're just stuck with it. And, you know, we really need to connect with our brand owners on the front end, be at the table of that conversation to say, you know, look, you know, is this designed for disassembly? Is this designed for recyclability? You know, how do we make sure that we can handle it with the infrastructure that we have? You know, I mean, these, the pieces of equipment that you have to, I mean, that put these, the MRFs together, I mean, these are massive pieces of investment. And, you know, and then, you know, with brands changing, you're, you're, they're just trying to keep up. And I feel like uh, it's just really challenging, especially, you know, on the recovery side. Um, and, we, you know, they say, and it's funny because, you know, we mentioned China a lot, you know, and they have that proverb, crisis opportunity. So they've created this crisis, and then we have the opportunity to look at what do we do now. Uh, and I think we have an opportunity to connect more with domestic markets to really think about how we want to handle our trash or really how we want to handle our material. You know, do we want to create all this trash? You know, what does this mean for us? You know, we, you know, we have our the disposable market has just exploded you know, in the last 10 years. And we need to really kind of think through what that means for us as a country and, you know, kind of, you know, see if, how sustainable is that, you know? Um, you mentioned jobs stability, and I think we all would agree on that. And But it's an industry that's faced now with a um, lack of drivers, mm -hmm. uh, lack of people at work, work on the sorting lines it, it's it's tough i know in my operation it's tough to get people and i see a lot of heads nodding up there um but what you then you talk about the technology you know that's coming out um you know where is uh artificial intelligence going to take us what are robotics where is that going to take us so you mentioned in your um, beginning nicole about are we going to have driverless trucks so automated driverless trucks to go around what, what do you see you guys are a lot more technology technology advanced than i am what do you what do you what do you see is this going to take place we we need to do something with our, about our driver situation and our sorters and and the other part of that is cleaning up the contamination is is, is robotics going to get us there I mean, I think in terms of the self-driving vehicle, I think it's coming. And I, I think it's going to take us all a little bit of time to, you know, catch up to. There is a truck that comes down my street and has no person in it, and it's not going to, you know, hurt my children. Um, but I think, you know, you talk about we have an, you know, an aging population in our driver our driver ranks, obviously. And, um, you know, we look at the millennials that are coming in and what do the millennials like? And, you know, the millennials like a flex flexibility, you know, can you do then, is there a way we can change the working environment to accommodate that? You know, millennials also seem, seem to like gaming, right? So is there a way that we can make the inside of a truck be a little bit more, you know, not a video game console by any means, but just make it a little bit more automated and a little less labor intensive because, you know, our drivers are amazing. They get, you know, they can do stuff that I didn't even think could happen, you know, push bins out. And, you know, that is a hard job. I, I was on the back of a garbage truck for literally 20 minutes. And after that, I was like, I was, I'm done. I, I can't throw anymore, you know. And you guys are throwing for 10 hours a day, every single day in rain and snow. And I mean, I had ideal conditions. So I think, you know, we grow, going to automated truck collection is one, you know, making the inside of the cab a little bit more technology friendly. Um, and then finding a way to kind of accommodate the millennials in terms of their flexibility, I think, will help drive people to our industry. Yeah, I think uh, technology, um, like JS systems and all this, is definitely coming to play. I think having an analyst on on your staff is crucial. I think uh, that way you can collect the data that you need to adjust routes. I mean, you can pick up the cleanest stuff first that could be towards the front of your truck. You know, that way the, the back end stuff is harder obviously to I mean easier to sort um, and, and you can expect you know the, the stuff at the front to be dirtier you can 
it audit routes just like you audit buildings and there's so much that we can do with technology to track that you do this on a constant basis i mean some of these programs out there will do this for you and, and literally put a trend together of what you should be doing and what you shouldn't be doing i think with uh, some of the, the the drivers that we have are amazing and they know their routes the ones we work with at least they know everything that was just said but having great training programs to kind of yeah push that to whoever their assistant is. I mean, I've noticed that a lot. Their assistants kind of get switched over a lot. They don't get seen, um, in my opinion, as as such an important part of the team there as the driver, because the driver is the one who's taking control. And I think um, working with the assistants, especially if you know someone's about to retire, they're getting to that age where it's almost time for them to leave. Someone has been on a route for years, you know, um, it's important to get that information off them. And, and really it's important to document the whole way through standardizing processes so that way, you can have a set list of things for them to already be, to already teach instead of, you know, try to figure out what they have, what information they have at the end of it. Any, anybody else with, uh, with technology, robotics? Well, I mean, it's interesting, you know, we talked about safety just a little bit earlier, you know, and it, you know, I, I can see robotics coming in, in some of those jobs that are, somewhat dangerous or, you know, some, some of those jobs that are really challenging, you know, you have a lot of air quality issues. And so, you know, can we take some of the dirtiest jobs and, you know, utilize technology in a way where it helps all of us? And I, I definitely see that coming. You know, it's really exciting to see what's happening in bulk handling systems. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a facility uh, that just got permitted in Berkeley County, South Carolina, and they're going to have four of those mm. uh, robotic arms. And um, it's just amazing mm. to see, you know, I, I wouldn't have thought that this would be possible five years ago. So um, having the built-in artificial intelligence, is, it's it's exciting. Yeah, let me know when that one opens. I do want to see those robotics uh, that the BHS is putting out down there. <clears throat> Sean, anything to add to, to uh, what the other guys have said? I just went through a massive reroute uh, as far as Northeast Los Angeles goes. Um, so the idea of a robot doing the job that the drivers do is, I'm, it's daunting, but also optimistic. I don't think, maybe we'll see it in my lifetime, um, but the culture change with that will be insane. Uh, what I'm kind of excited about are battery powered trucks. I think that, that you know, we we're, we're already have a lot of low emission vehicles anyway, but the battery powered vehicles and fleets, I think is gonna be really great uh, for the future. Awesome, awesome. I've been kind of asking the questions up here. Are there any questions from the audience? We're kind of coming up on the end of our performance here. Does anybody in the audience have any questions for our panel? Not right now. All right, then I, you can't ask a question. Right? <laughs> <laughs> There's a question. I'll get to a question at some point. So we got to pull around. Being in, being in the industry for a while. Tell me the whole that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but being in the uh, industry for a while, <clears throat> I've always been disappointed that the waste industry does not apply a lot of, of effort and finances towards research and development. That we rely on the industry is always relying on somebody else to do it. As a matter of fact, it's like watching small kids play sports, whether it's baseball, football, soccer. You put them in their position, blow the whistle, and they all come to the ball. So when you watch the industry evolve, um, you know, hydraulics on trucks, and everybody did their thing, somebody developed on everybody runs over to that, and then they ran over to different systems, and you know, instead of the industry coming together and developing new technology, they rely on all these little small things. And we kind of see that here. I mean, everybody <clears throat> up in the panel, you've got great programs, great ideas, but you got know, a little part going here, a little part going there, some going here. It's like little BBs hitting on instead of you know shot really driving programs along. So get into the question. <laughs> so the question is, why don't we involve the uh, NWRA more in pushing these programs? Now you talked about producer responsibility. You're absolutely right. You know why are and as, as consumers and people in the business, why don't we have you know on staff knowledgeable people in the design end and and on the recycling that comes together and say you know you 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 putting together a product you know what are you doing here we can't process that but mm -hmm. here we have design people we have technical people what are you trying to do let let us help you with that 
and you know, carry enough weight and, and you know, through all your social media and everything you guys do to get people to notice, make people come to you before they do this design. So I think, uh, God, really have a question. I guess it's a sermon. So I think <laughs> you have a responsibility to work with the NWRA to make that happen. I mean, otherwise, it, again, it's just little small individual programs trying to make your mark, but you have an opportunity, and of course there's a room full of people here that, um, that, that if anybody disagrees, keep it to yourself. <laughs> um, but you need to pull it together, and, and we don't hear enough of that. We, we need to everybody get together and say, yeah, of course, you know, we have a problem, we have a problem because the packaging coming in and we, we don't know how to deal with it. It's got four different kinds of plastics. Should be on the front end of that. That shouldn't be a surprise. This whole thing with China shouldn't be a surprise. I mean, really, we knew it was going to happen sooner or later. The economy in China wasn't going to sustain itself. And the people in the industry knew what was in those containers <laughs> when it was going out there. I don't think anybody's surprised at the contamination levels, but we need more of of getting together and making it happen instead of waiting for it to happen. And, and you know, the NRW and can do that with everybody in this room, so. Yeah, yeah thank you, I, I, it, it's a good point. Uh, one of the things that we have just done, the association has just done, is to put together in a, in a, in a, a consortium, if you will, of all of the, the, the box manufacturers and the, you know, the, the plastics people and the glass people and whether they're their trade associations or what. So we do get in the room. So we do can, from our end, talk about designing for recycling, which is, which is what you're talking about, because you're right. Unfortunately, when you talk with manufacturers, they want to they wanna put together a package that the consumer wants to buy, and it's not always what we, what we can run through our facilities. So that's a, that is a, you know, a tough thing to do. But we are, we are working on putting that group together so we do have input. Any, any comments? Well, I just wanted to comment that, uh, so we're dealing with this right now on the Carpet America Recovery Effort Board with carpet. I mean, especially with California, you know, California, you know, doing the, uh, you know, putting putting a, an additional cost on carpet from the get go, and so your your that pro, that recycling is technically built in. But here's the challenge. I mean, the challenge is you have a lot of PET carpet, and there's no outlets for that material. So what do you do with it? You know, so you know nylon <clears throat> nylon carpet. You know, we've got great markets for that. Um, polypropylene, great markets. But um, so you know. CARE has talked a, a lot about this same issue, like why don't we do some of this R&D ourselves? And so um, we're actually contracting right now with um, uh, NC State, their textiles program, you know, trying different kinds of opportunities for non-wovens and some other applications where you could actually utilize that end product because uh, it's a big volume issue, especially, you know, and it's all residential carpet. And one of the other challenges that, I mean, they're dealing with, they're seeing more PET carpet coming online. Uh, so that, that nylon is shrinking. So what they can actually recycle is shrinking. We're seeing more producer uh, PET carpet because you can get a 10-year turnover on it. Um, but there's no recycling outlets for it. And yeah, uh, this is a conversation that we're having right now. And, um, and we've been doing that R&D. I think we're in the middle of a, of a three-year contract for some R&D to look at out opportunities and outlets for, for new products. Yes. In the last 20 years, we are living in a world with disruptive things in some different areas. In the last, uh, I don't know how many years, we didn't have anything disruptive in waste management. If we see the history of waste management, disruptively speaking, we don't have nothing in the last maybe hundreds of years. What do you think that will disrupt us in the future? Thank you. That's an interesting one. Mm -hmm. what, what disruptions, I mean, we, we, we could probably call China the big disruption today and, and, and light waiting, it could be a disruption. What other disruptions do you see in the waste and recycling business? 
I, I think, I mean, it's happening now, whether or not you guys want to accept it or not, but the concept of sustainability, being more sustainable, organizations become more sustainable. That, that's going to affect all the material that you're going to receive. So I think it was said earlier, if you guys plan, uh, I, I know Armour, uh, the people we deal with, they bought a bunch of stuff from VHS or fibers, and we we're cutting paper as much as possible. You know, that that's a huge disruption to... To all the millions that were spent on this this type of machine to collect a certain type of material, if more people follow suit, then that piece of machine is really going to be obsolete. You know, and it, this is, I think, the first time ever that this that, that the whole waste industry is getting updated. For a long time, we've depended on waste haulers in the back end of the waste industry to take care of everything for us. And I, I mean, we're at a time where people are learning learning what to do on their own. So we could, I mean, like I said earlier, take it together and connect and, and uh, anticipate this and maybe teach the prog programs that, you know, will be beneficial to everyone or let people figure it out on their own. And I, I guarantee um, as it, in California, there's a lot of costs that are getting cut, especially to public programs. I mean, it's been happening for a long time and we're going to have to figure out a way to continue. We're going to have to figure out a way for us to survive, you know, and, and a lot of this um, contracts that last 10 years and all this is a lot of that is, is gone. We're doing three years, maybe with two year options now, you know, just because the change, the industry is changing so fast and we need to be able to update if we need to. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. I think we're going through a paradigm shift right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. there is a hall of people that have technology and the ability to, you know, inform our customers that, you know, Hey, maybe, our truck is running late. Maybe they got a flat tire or they ran out of gas, whatever. Um, so in, in going through this shift with all the technology, this might be us kind of circumnavigating that disruption. Um, I've been saying it for years. The, you know, the industry is, is the dinosaur industry. And we are now in that, that, that paradigm shift, like I said, of us taking it to this uh, new millennium time. Um, apps, uh, even on the vehicles, even on the trucks. We have uh, in LA, we use this service called Fleet Mine. So if there's ever a mess or a customer calls and says, hey, you didn't get my container, I could pull up the truck information, look at the cameras mm -hmm. and say, oh, that's not exactly true. Mm -hmm. What you did was you took all the stuff that was on the ground and then put it into the container and then tried to play one off on us. So having all this uh, technology and data to really inform the customer as well as keep our fleet optimization is, is really awesome in my opinion. So it you know, goes without saying that this uh, education of everybody and getting a clean material that we can reuse and keeping materials out of the waste stream is definitely the way to go. But this issue of yeah. you know, the uh, disruption is very real. You know, I look at Blockbuster Video and, you know, we all used to go to Blockbuster to rent a video and now we just go on Netflix at our house. And, you know, I don't think that, you know, Netflix took over Blockbuster because we were sick of paying late fees. We just, it took over Blockbuster, in my opinion, because it was more convenient. So I think what will disrupt the industry is whoever can figure out how to make it most convenient. How do I make my experience convenient? And I think that will be what actually has the potential to disrupt. It sounds to me That's like a disruption is. could be going back to that opportunity question I asked you. As, as, as we get these disruptions thrown at us, we as an industry, whether it's through technology or whatever, we come up with a way to get around that disruption and make it, make it work for us. So that's that opportunity. Um, yes, we got one time, for, time for one more. <laughs> My question to you guys is thank you so much for continuing to pave the way and make changes. Um, is how do we educate um, across the board? And recycling being one of the biggest, because for me being a private hauler, going to our local levels and trying to get it somewhere, like I want to do one thing, but nobody else wants to do it. And you're asking for help, like, okay, help me educate our customers. Why can't we educate our customers? This is what needs to be in the can. And now we shouldn't do this, but nobody wants to take um, responsibility <laughs> to help educate or to make that change. So it's pretty much how do we get the education across the board? Maybe not even statewide is, you know, and I know that um, I just feel like we're, we don't utilize um, each other as much as we should. Um, and I'm hoping that you guys can help make that difference. Yeah. So. Uh, okay, uh, <laughs> uh, I would, uh, being unfamiliar with the hauling company you work for, wherever you're coming from in, in the stateside, uh, I would say 
community partnerships would be a great place to start, you know, participating in Earth Days, mulch giveaways, uh, e-waste events, uh, things of that nature. You know, stickers on the containers are also another really good hit. Everything that you see goes in here. Everything else goes in your trash container. Uh, social media is great. Like I said, I'm unfamiliar with where you're from. You could be coming from Chicago um, or, you know, Little Rock. But um, just being able to be more present in the community, uh, truck signs would be another thing that I would say, because they're basically driving billboards. So if you could say, hey, this is a recycled truck, the materials in here are plastics, paper, blah, 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 versus this is just a trash truck, we're taking everything else. That would kind of be a moving idea. I just want to take that a little further, and it sounds absolutely right, but they, uh, one thing that I would say is adjust your programs, understand your client's goals, and do... Uh, do that research that, that you need to, to get there. Like if you do waste audits, don't do it based on what you can sell. Do it based on what the material is and what they're getting out and how easy it's going to be able for you to sort. If you do like a wet, dry material, that makes it so convenient for the client, you know, because then you get two materials and then now you only have dry to sort and your wet can go to your composting facility. You're still going to have to sort from there, but it's not one big, dirty pile. Um, understanding the routes on campus, understanding the client's, uh, like I said, sustainability goals or whatever they're, they're trying to achieve, um, their material. Uh, sometimes incineration, even though we don't like to think about it, but it, it may be best. A lot of our lab waste can be contaminated with hazardous materials and syringes and all this, you know, other stuff that we don't really want to touch. Rather than hope that they separate it themselves, maybe that, that's another form of diversion that we're currently using to kind of get there. Um, just really being able to tell, you know, do waste audits in a way that they understand and then that way they can communicate to their purchasing. You know, that eliminates the need for them to, per to have someone on staff to do that for them. And, and you kind of gain that. Um, I mean, in LA, they're doing a lot of stuff where the franchise came with uh, recycling coordinators uh, per certain clients, right? Something like that. Yeah, but those, those recycling coordinators are really just the hauler's way of kind of hitting that goal and just being there. I don't see them, at least now, coming in and really understanding uh, the, the waste material that people are generating. Elementary schools is another one, too. Get them while they're young, and then they mm -hmm. can place their parents at home. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, we do elementary schools. My thing is just getting not just myself and my customers, it's um, state and national because everyone seems to take different things just like what you're saying. The last thing, if you do waste audits and you make stickers, just put the stuff that you find in their waste. Yeah. That way you don't have to like generalize it. I mean, they're literally dumping this. This doesn't go here. I mean, it makes it that much easier. Uh, I, I, I agree with you. We're, we're working on that right now in Massachusetts where we're trying to get a standard acceptable list for all of the MRFs and all of the haulers without getting into too much trouble with, you know, you know, setting things, but at least have that acceptable list so that you're accepting one thing and he's accepting another thing and the municipality is, is pushing us to, to take more of the stuff and we're allowing them to do that. So we are working on that. Two, di two, two different streams. I, th I, think, I think we as processes have learned that we, that we can't do, in today's environment where we're getting so much contamination, we can't allow that to happen anymore, and that's what we're working on up there. We are at the end of our, our time, and uh, I see Dan standing in the back. He must be ready for the next, next program here today. Um, Jesse, Nicole, Anna, Sean, thank you very much, and congratulations for being 40 under 40. Appreciate thank your you. time. Thank you.